Good morning, and uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I'm Perry John Hormuz, I'm from UC Davis, and the official title of my talk is Mapping Free Genome Analysis, but I'd like the unofficial more tamers, tamers, and more tamers. <laughs> so, with the advent of sequencing, especially in the last 10 years, the field of genomics has changed a lot. The cost of sequencing has, dro has dropped dramatically, as shown in this plot, and this has made us able to sequence whole whole human genomes with high coverage with cost of around $1,000 or even less. This means that we can sequence tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of humans and study population genomics, genomics of disease, evolution, and so on. It has reached a point that it's fair to say now that the, it has reached a point that's fair to say that uh, genomic analysis, analysis of data, is now a bigger bottleneck than production of the data and sequence. So, how do we do this genomic analysis? How do we compare different genomes using the available sequencing data? The most common way of studying, doing this analysis is using mapping-based approaches. In mapping-based approaches, first you map the reads to the reference genome, that's a human reference genome. You try to predict variation by seeing the differences between the mapped reads and what's seen in the reference genome. And then you compare different samples based on the variations that's been predicted. And there are many methods developed for each of these stages. For map mapping reads, there are, for instance, <coughs> OTI, OTI2, BWA, BWA, which are the most common type of mappers that, that you have used for sure. And there are more specialized mappers for some specific task that you're interested in. And then for variation prediction using the mapping data, there are many tools available, for instance, and they are usually specialized in a specific type of variation. For instance, if you're interested in SNPs and indels, probably GAPQ or Freebase is the tool that you use. If you're interested in structure variation and copy number variation, for instance, you will use Lumpy, Delhi, Vaishantar, Tardis, and things like this. And there are lots of tools have been developed for each of these types of variation, and each one has strengths or weaknesses. So, how these mapping-based methods do the prediction is by comparing the map reads with reference and trying to see what are the differences. For instance, if you have map trees and you see at a particular location the reference is a A and you see a lot of Cs, you say that, okay, there is a possibility of that being a SNP. Or if you see an indel in a lot of reads, you'll predict an indel. Or if you're dealing with structure variation, you see discrepancies in the mapping, for instance, the reduction in the number of reads mapped or change in the in the distance between read and read ends, or breaking of the reads to make prediction of the structure of variation. And each of these signatures is used in different ways using different tools available to make these predictions. But there are some major shortcomings of mapping-based approaches, and some of them are as follows. First, if you're dealing with a region which goes to a lot of genetic variation, a lot of changes, these mapping-based methods usually don't work well done. For instance, HLA region. Predicting variation in that, those regions tend to be very difficult. If you're dealing with incomplete sequencing genome, GAPs, or highly, highly repetitive, repetitive regions in the genome, like centromeres or telomeres, mapping-based methods usually don't work. <coughs> it's possible that you're not interested in human genome. In human genome, when we are doing sphere study, human genome, you're likely to have a reference genome to do the mapping. But what if you're interested in a specific plant that we don't have a good reference genome? Then the mapping-based approaches will not work. Usually, mapping-based approaches are very specific to a specific type of variant. For instance, they, are, they, might, they tend to be very good at SNP, but on other type of variations, they're not as good. The quality of the calls or predictions that you get is highly dependent on the quality of mapping. We have bad mapping and bad predictions. Finally, these approaches tend to be resource intensive. <coughs> mapping thousands of genomes can take a lot of time. So, an alternative approach is let's not map the reads genome. Let's do a mapping free approach such that we compare the reads directly and try to make predictions and see some of these issues that we raised can be solved or not. At the core of a mapping free approach is the concept of chambers. Chambers are a short sequences, let's say short sequence of three brace pairs, that you get from the segment of the genome that you're interested. Let's say this is your let's say this is the sequence that you have. All the trimers are all the three bases, consecutive three bases that you have. So that's a chamber. Chamber analysis and chamber methods have been quite popular and very powerful in solving different problems in genomics. These 
are some of them that I am listing here. Uh, for instance, de novo, de novo genome analysis, de novo, de novo genome assembly has been completely based on based on KMERS. Reference-free variant detection, reference-free common variant genotyping, transcriptome analysis, large-scale database searches, differential expression, and sequence control, uh, controlling uh, the quality of data. All of them can be done based on camera analysis. We're going to focus on this three topic today. What's good about cameras is that we can count them. When we have a whole genome sequence data, a whole, whole transcriptome data, we can count the number of times that a particular camera appears. There's a lot of tools to do this counting. And then we can build a histogram, which x-axis is the number of times that the camera appears for camera abundance, and y-axis is the set of the cameras that are particular contents. The different methods that are available for counting cameras that can provide the approximate count or exact count. And here is a list of some of the camera counting tools, but their list is much longer. I just put a few of them that I could think last night of my mind. But let's look at the, one of these. This is a, a data I got from Ryan, and this is a camera count from chromosome 14 of humans. So the y-axis is the camera abundance, and, uh, and the x, sorry, the x-axis is the camera abundance, and y-axis is the number of times a particular camera abundance is seen in this whole genome sequence data. So when you look at this, you see there are some camers, some abundances, that a lot of camers have that abundance, for instance, one. In your data, you will see a lot of camers that appear only one time. Then there are camers that appear around 40, 50 times, and then there are camers that appear many, many times. So let's start with the question. What do you think these camers that only appear once or twice in your data, in your whole genome sequence data, represent. Errors, exactly. An error in the sequencing will appear as a unique chain, one camera that appears only one time. You made a mistake in your sequencing, so you will see that camera appearing only one time or two times or so. Then, you have camers that are from non-repeat regions, and they have to go 40, 50 times, based on the coverage that you have. And what are these cameras that appear many, many times? 200, 300 times? Repeats. There are cameras that come from the repeat regions of the genome. So by, by this simple counting, you are able to say which cameras are errors, which cameras are potentially coming from unique regions of genome, and which cameras are coming from the repeat regions of the genome. Okay. So let's look at the de novo assembly. I'm going to look at de novo assembly very, very lightly just to introduce for the mapping free approach variant prediction. There are two main formulations for Genova assembly. First one is based on overlap layout consensus approach, which was the one of the first assembly approaches that was tried. It was used for human genome assembly build, and it tries to solve the Hamiltonian hat problem, which is a very hard problem to solve. A second idea, or second main approach, which is very popular, is the Bruin graph assembly approach. This, takes a, this approach takes an unintuitive step at the beginning to break the reads to smaller pieces even, which are the cameras, and then try to stitch them back together and build that. This approach is very popular for short read, uh, for short read assemblers, and there are many assemblers that look for this. So let's look at a little bit more into the Bruin graph assembly and see how it works. The Bruin graph assembly, the Bruin graph is a directed graph built from cameras which every camera from the whole genome sequence data that you have is a node in this graph. And you put edge between, directed edge between every two nodes, if one of them is, can be expressed by using the other node, shifting all the base pairs one to the left and adding another, another base pair. Let's take an example. Let's say we have these two sequences, and we are interested in cameras of size three, so we consider all the three base pairs. So all the three base pairs that come from these two sequences are the nodes, right? And we're going to put directed edges if one node can be constructed from the other mode node by shifting one to the left and adding a base pair. So as you can see, this way, k minus one base pair of suffix and prefix between the two nodes will match, right? So for ACT, the edge group will be to CTG because the CT will match and I can add another base pair. From CTG, it will be TGC because TGs will match and I can add a C or TGA because I can add the A. That's how you build the Jabrian graph based on input sequence. Is that clear? Perfect. Because this 
will be the basis of all the methods that we need. So now that we are able to construct a Dubrian graph, the Dubrian assembler works as follows. And by the way, the idea was first suggested for using a Dubrian graph for building assembler in this paper by Paul Kelsner, uh, I think 2001. So the idea is as follows. You get the reads, you break it into chambers, you build the Dubrian graph the way that I just showed you, and then you try to find an Eulerian path in this graph, and that would be your essence. The good thing about Eulerian path is that, given a graph, you can very easily check if it has an Eulerian path or not, and if it has one, you can generate it. It can be done in full moment of time. And there are many assemblies that have been, assemblers that have been built with this idea. These are few of them, but there are many more, there are 20, 30, even more. So this is the general idea of De Bruyne assembler. And let's see how we can use this idea for predicting variations in multiple genomes without doing that. So, <coughs> our objective is to be able to find genetic variation in multiple samples between them without doing that. And there are a lot of tools that have been developed recently. The ones that we will look at is Cortex, which was the, one of the first tools developed for finding variation between multiple samples. And they introduced the concept of color Dubrian graph, so they extended the Dubrian graph. It's Disco SNP and Disco SNP Plus, which similarly uses different graphs for finding SNPs and indels between multiple genome, six multiple genome sequence data. Scallop, which for, is for finding de novo indels, and here de novo, I mean indels which are not inherited from parents. In other words, when you have a trio or quad, a family that you have sequenced, and you want to know what are the variations that are new in the child. So they introduced an approach for finding NOVA in those, which is not based on uh, mapping. NOVA break is an approach for finding somatic variation between cancer tumor, cancer, cancer tumor and normal tissue without mapping. And finally, HOT is fi for finding statistical significant SNPs or other type of variants when you don't want to do mapping and you only have the whole genome sequence data from multiple samples and you want to know what is the SNP which is significant in the cases versus control. And finally, uh, we will look at the method for predicting de novo variation in, in, multi, in a trio of whole genome sequence data. So let's start with the first tool, which is Cortex. And to be honest, I think it's the first tool that mentioned, that suggested using reference-free mapping for predicting variation. It was developed as part of the 1000 Genome Project. Um, it builds on the concept of the Bruin graph that we looked at and extended to color the Bruin graph. And the way that it does is that for every node and every edge in the brain graph, we assume multiple colors based on the samples that that uh, camera is seen. For instance, if a camera is seen in one, only one of the samples gets the color assigned to that sample. If it's seen in two samples, you assign to that camera the two colors for that sample. That's a, that's a simple color graph. So you record for each camera what are the samples that camera was observed. This method is very good at predicting uh, non-SNP variants like indels and structural variations. And as I said, introduce the color Dubrin graph. So a uh, reiteration of what a color Dubrin graph is. <coughs> color Dubrin graph is the Dubrin graph, which you have colors assigned to nodes and edges based on the samples that each node or edge is seen. So if a node or edge seen in only one sample, it gets one color. If it's seen in five samples, it gets five different colors. <laughs> Um, you can add into the color to bring up the reference reference to if you want. In other words, you can get the cameras from a reference, and that would be an additional color you can add to it. And the interesting thing is that if you have a variation in a couple of these samples and not in another work, you will have probably cameras that will have color for, from only those samples. And that will show itself in the Dubrin graph as a sort of bubbles that you can see the bubbles and see, oh, this is a variation between these two sets of samples. And we will see how. And polymorphism, even, even homozygous, heterozygous polymorphism, you can see as bubbles there. So let's look at a couple of structures that come up in, in color to bring up. Let's look at the simplest example, a simple SNP. Let's look at, these are the two sequences that you have, and you have a T SNP here, right? Two different samples. So if you build a Dubrin graph, it's going to look as bubbles. And the cameras that have the SNP only appear from this sample. So you can give it different colors, and just based on that, you know that some SNP is, 
happen from one of these samples to the other. Although the structure might not be so clean, even a simple SNP might become quite complicated. This is still a SNP, but in a more complicated region, and it will look as follows. So now, the one color, the red, and the other color, the blue, are indicating still a SNP, but in a more complex sort of fashion. But the nice thing is that complex indels or multiple SNPs again will show themselves as bubbles in this graph. So in this case, the two, the two sequences have lots of variations. They have two base pair indel and two base pair uh, SNPs. And you can see uh, two paths in this graph. So the idea of the color degree graph and cortex is found. Consider build the color color different graphers by considering both. Let's say we have only two samples. Consider both sample cameras together. Build the build the different graph. It looks as follows. Color them. This is from sample one. This is from sample two, and then predict the variations. The structures that appear in this graph will tell you what the variations. Is. For instance, this is a this is a heterozygous variation in the blue sample because. You have a blue here and separate here, so this potentially is a heterozygous sample. Or you might have a homozygous uh, variation. The two samples completely separate. And then you might have repeats, which look as follow, and so on. So how does the calling of the variation work? Let's say you have two genomes. You have a blue genome and red genome, and black is the reference. By comparing these structures that I showed, you can, let's say, compare only the two genomes and forget the reference for a second. You can see the differences in the positions A, B, and C. And based on these bubbles, you can predict variation that exists in one of these samples versus other one. If you add the reference, you can even localize the variation. At what location this variation between A and B exists. You can also potentially find variations that the two genomes agree, but they are different from the uh, reference. That's how Cortex uh, predicts its variations and does quite a good job at predicting predicting angles. So some pros and cons of uh, Cortex. Uh, first of all, when you're dealing with mapping approaches, if you map the reference, you have a huge bias of how the, how the new genome you think it will look. If it doesn't look like that, you have an advantage when using this sort of uh, mapping free approaches. So, so, so mapping methods will work quite good for SNP, but mapping free like Cortex will work quite good for indels or structure variations. Um, so there's a one tricky point here, and that's about all the De Bruyne graphs that you deal with, no matter it's color De Bruyne graph or ordinary De Bruyne graph, is the size of the K. How do you know what is the correct size of the K? And that's kind of more of an art, but there are papers that have been developed that are showing that you can look at multiple different camera size to find what works best for your assembly and take that. For instance, there, there's a paper in Bioinformatic that, that you can take a look at. It's quite nice. Okay, so this was Cortex, but there are other methods that have been developed that use some similar ideas, like Disco SNP and Disco plus plus. That again uses a De Bruyne graph from multiple samples to predict variations which is exist in one sample network. They don't color the nodes in this approach, but again, they will try to find bubbles in the graph and see if those bubbles indicate variation from one sample to another. And they use interesting tricks. For instance, if you're dealing with isolated SNP, right? The path, if it's a truly an isolated SNP, the length of the paths in the two bubbles should be exactly K, which is the, the camera size that you have. So for instance, using these tricks, they can really filter down and find the true variation. So this is the overall pipeline that their method has. They get the reads, all reads from multiple samples. They, re they create the debris graph, and they start to predict the, bu the bubbles that potentially are the variation. And when they get the variation, they map the reads back to the variation to make sure what they've seen is truly different between two samples. It's not a repeat, and they can give quality score of the prediction, how much they believe that prediction is correct. And then they can report it to report the variation. So they did a comparison uh, between Disco SNP and Cortex and other approach methods which are more assembly based for predicting SNPs and indels. And they can show that their results and also Cortex, which is another mapping based, does a better job for, a somewhat better job for predicting indels, although this hybrid is also kind of an assembly based, so it's not a perfect comparison. If you compare it against 
mapping based approaches, they do much better for predicting indels. But the good thing about cortex versus, but the good thing about viscous deep versus cortex is that because it doesn't build a color different graph, it's faster. It can do things much faster and uses less memory in comparison. Okay, so these were two two methods for predicting SNPs and indels uh, without mapping mapping the endpoints. Uh, but there are more specialized methods that have been developed for solving problems more specific to what, what, what one might be interested in. One of them, for instance, is finding de novo variation. Here, de novo variation, what I mean, is variation which is not inherited from parents. Let's say you have a mother, father, and a child. You do whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. And you're interested to know what is the variation that is brand new in a child, not inherited from parents. Those are known as de novo variation. So one of the first methods developed for finding de novo variation, especially de novo indels, <coughs> using uh, sequencing data was uh, using whole exome sequencing. And uh, exome sequencing only covers 2% of the genome, so the size of the, uh, size of the memory needed for solving problem is smaller, so they could, they could approach, approach the problem. And uh, it's very good for studying diseases like at autism and so on. So they tried to find de novo indels without mapping the reads, when they have mother, father, and a child sequence. The method they develop is called SCAL, and it's kind of a combination of mapping and mapping free and mapping based. They first map the reads, but they do that only to pick their, pick their reads in a specific location they're interested in. Let's say they are specifically interested in the exons of a particular gene, so they first map the reads to only get the reads that are interested in that region, but they don't use the reads for the mapping for prediction. They just Use that for extracting the reads. Then they build a Dubrin graph. They try to find a path in the Dubrin graph they built to get the assembly. If they can, they believe there is repeats. They try to increase the K size. If you remember, I said K is quite important in the Dubrin graph construction. So they try to play with the K size to get the assembly. Oh. Get the assembly. And then they map the assembly, the whole assembly that's much bigger, with the variation that they believe exists to the reference item. So this works quite well for predicting indels, as they have shown in their comparison for, so this is their tool, these are all other indel calling methods, and this is the result they have. And especially when it starts to offer from other approaches, when they are looking for indels bigger than five based term. Again, SOAP, you know, SOAP indel is an assembly based. So the assembly based methods start to do better than non-assembly based methods like these ones, which are uh, mapping based for indel prediction. Okay. So Till now, we looked at the methods that predict variation when you have multiple samples. We looked at methods that predict de novo variation when you have mother, father, and child. There's also methods for predicting somatic variation without mapping the reads to reference genome. What is a somatic variation? You have a cancer, cancer tumor. You have a normal tissue from the same patient. You want to know what is the variation in the, in the tumor that does not exist in the normal it's very common in cancer studies to find somatic variation. And because of somatic variation can have different allele frequency in the tumor, it's very hard to directly apply mapping-based approaches. But the idea they used was a mapping-free approach. And that's quite intuitive, is that they said, let's look at all the reads that come from tumor. Let's look at the k-mers that we get. Let's filter the k-mers based on the k-mers that we see from the normal tissue and k-mers that we see from reference. So what remains is the k-mers that only is unique to the tumor tissue. Those are the red k-mers. Now, let's get the reads that have the red k-mers, assemble it. Now I have the reads that only have the somatic variation, and I assemble the figure, and now I can map it to reference to not predict the somatic variation. So that's what they do. The, the, the name of the tool is NovaBreak. Any question about how to do it? And they compared the NOVA break on a synthetic data for seeing how, it, how well it works for predicting somatic uh, variation. And they, they outperform other the mapping-based approaches. And more importantly, their breakpoint, because you can imagine, because they're building the assembly, is much better than the mapping-based approaches. So this shows the breakpoint. They, they are centered around zero, means that their, their breakpoint is not up. And on real data, they were able to predict more validated uh, it, 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 
structure variation breakpoints in the real cell line by, by making way less prediction versus the mapping list, which is just quite, quite nice. Okay, so till now we looked at the mapping free methods for predicting variation via multiple genomes. We looked at the Genovo variation prediction using mapping free approach. We looked at the somatic variation prediction using Genova approach. We can also look at finding significantly associated variation when we have case and control. Now, so let's say you are doing a GWA study, you sequence 1,000 cases, you have sequence 1,000 control, and you want to know, without mapping the risk back to reference genome, what are the variations which is significantly uh, associated with cases versus control. So there has been recently a method developed called Hawk from Rachman et al., and it does exactly that. So the goal is finding a significantly associated variant in cases and control. The method hard work that follows, it gets all the reads from cases and control, count the cameras in cases and control separately, and tries to predict which of the cameras in cases is significantly higher in, in cases versus control. So they have a very nice statistical setting that they can show, they can, they can accurately predict significant cameras. By significant cameras, cameras that are significant appear more in cases versus controls after they consider the depth of coverage and other issues. And when they know what are the significant cameras, they can get the their reads and local assembled and predict variation which are significantly higher in cases versus controls. They also fix for population structure and things like this when they're picking the significant cameras. Okay. So, we also looked at the uh, finding variations which are significantly higher in cases and controls. The final method in this category of methods that we're going to look at is finding de novo variation using whole genome sequencing. The de novo variation, the de novo in the lab for scalp that we looked was only on uh, whole exome sequencing data. And uh, this one is using whole genome data and it uses, uh, and it's not only in the, it uses can predict de novo type of variation, any, any variation. So again, the goal is that you have a sequence from mother, from father, mother, and a child, and let's say a child has a specific disease, and you want to know what are the new variations, de novo variation in child. So the idea is quite simple. You get the whole genome sequence data from the group, you count the cameras in all three samples, you find an interesting camer, meaning a camer that appears in the child and does not appear in the parents. You get the reads from the child that has the interesting camera, build the context, and then predict a variant and assign a likelihood score based on the support of the camera that you see in the child and not the <laughs> So this method is called Kevla. And for instance, here, there's a simulation that performance of Kevla for predicting genome variations compared against mapping free and mapping based approaches. So Kevla is the red, the scallop was the, ma was the mapping free approach. This was, it was a mapping free approach, but trio de novi and GHQ are mapping based approach. And especially as you can see when we go higher in those, the mapping free approaches do way better than mapping based approaches. So the result was compared against the known autism case and it was shown that a true structure variation, which before was validated using mapping, using this approach that I just showed, is able to be predicted and the exact breakpoint they can find because they have the assembly now. And you can see these are the cameras, the number of the times that the camera appears in child, mother, and father. So a simple approach works, fits as a correct point, and does a better job than a mapping-based approach with that one. Okay. So till now, all the methods that I mentioned was about discovery of the variations. We had a bunch of whole genome sequence or whole exome sequence data in a set of samples, and we wanted to find a discovery. To find a new variance. But what if our goal is easier? We want to only genotype variants. In other words, we have a whole genome sequence data. We have a bunch of variants that we know exist in that are common variation. And we know, want to know what is the set of variation in this sample and what the set of variations given. So there are quite a few tools that have been developed for solving this, this problem, like LAVA, uh, Vargin, MLAVA, and Nabulu. And I will go into two of them. So the problem is as follows. Let's look at the SNP genotype. You have three common SNPs in population, and you have, it, you have a donor genome, and you want to know if this SNP is, is, is a homozygous alternative, heterozygous, or homozygous reference in the new sequence sample. You can model the problem as follows. You have a reference genome, you have the reads from the donor, and you have the SNP data. This is that's been given to you. 
that output is the genotype assigned to each cell. So LAWA, first of this figure is from the LAWA paper, and this shows the two different approaches. The, the, on, in, the, the on and off is the mapping-based approach, so you reference the index and then map the rays and make prediction. This is their approach, which says you get this SNP list and the reference, you create a dictionary of all the k that are potentially overlapping with the SNP of interest. So you have a k for the SNP, if it's overlapped with the SNP, and a k for the reference, reference uh, version. And then you use LAVA based on the k count to predict which of them is a reference or alternative correct in that sample. So the pre -pro the, the process, the, the, the the pre-processing works as follows. You have the reads and you have the reference, reference snips. You pick the cameras of interest. These are the cameras that overlap or span the snip and the cameras in the reference allele which, which span the location of the snip. And when you have a new sample with the reads, you break the reads into cameras, you count the cameras, and then you go and in your hash table that you have for every snip, you count the reference, and the alternative times the read appears that supports the SNP or supports the reference based on the cameras that you have. So you only look at the reads that have those cameras that you pick. It becomes much easier on us. Now that you have the count, you can calculate the likelihood of the three genotypes, homozygous, heterozygous, or uh, reference, based on the reference count or alternative count that you have the, which is represented by alpha and beta here. And you're trying to predict the uh, probability of the genotype given the given the uh, given the, put in, put the given the alpha and beta, and you assume the probability of error of a ref, of a read being an error is some very small value. Let's see. And for doing that, the way that they suggest is just to calculate three very simple likelihood likelihood calculations based on based on the parameters that you have. Okay, and what they show is that. So what they show is that when you want to genotype the SNPs using their approach, LAVA and lava life, they do almost as good a job of using the mapping-based approaches like Bolt High and then using uh, GATK, uh, the best approaches that you can use. But the time that it takes to do the same prediction is much less than the time that you take using the mapping and the prediction. Okay, so um, this was for predicting SNPs. Uh, the two lava. They, the NRE group recently produced M lava. I just saw it. Um, it came out. It was for predicting indel and uh, multiple SNPs, which which works works good. Um, the final tool that I will show is called Nebula. It's for genotyping structure variations. So let's say you have a deletion. Let's say this red part is deleted in the new genome that you want, you're interested, in, and and you want to genotype these deletions. So, you, you define two different types of cameras. Cameras that are inside the deletion, let's call them inner cameras, and cameras that potentially span the breakpoint of deletions. But you have two different kinds of cameras. And then you try to predict genotype for the new sample that has been sequenced, such that the difference between, total difference between observed cameras counts and what is expected camera counts for each of these genotypes is minimized. So, uh, this becomes a combinatorial formulation. You can model it using linear programming, and then you can round the linear programming, the values that you get, you can round it to the uh, closest, closest genotype uh, from, the, from, the, from the real integer and get the, get the genotype. So how does the, this approach work for genotyping structure variations? This is a simulation on one of the samples that has been sequenced by long reads. Uh, we genotyped it on, on uh, uh, we simulated on uh, multiple samples and saw how Nebula versus the best tool for genotyping long period works. And as you can see, the result is quite familiar, quite similar. Uh, uh, long period does a bit better on prediction of between the, 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 between distinction between homozygous versus heterozygous uh, SPs, but not by much. But the difference is in time. So the amount of time that it gets to map there is and genotype is this much. And for Nebula, the mapping free approach will be order of magnitude faster. And the good thing is, 
this approach, the mapping three approaches are not dependent on type of SC. So for this analysis was on deletion, but you can assume any complex set of structural variation you want, and you can just pick the cameras and do the analysis. Versus a model that's method which is mapping based, you need to develop a new method for predicting some, for instance, inversion and so on. Okay. In summary, uh, we looked at different mapping free approaches for solving genomics problem. Besides a very powerful framework in genomics, uh, it's much more efficient to do analysis using mapping free approaches, especially if you don't want, you don't plan to reuse the mapping, for instance, for another another task. Uh, it's more sensitive to finding a non snip variation, like structure variation, and it does it will work better. Um, you can develop specialized approaches, for instance, finding de, de novo uh, variations or somatic variations, which might work very well. And there are still many open questions in this in this uh, in this type of projects that people can work. And because this was a tutorial, I uh, references that I think it, it, you're interested would be good to look at. Okay. So I have a question about um, the genotyping for SV. So when you have like moderately overlapping SVs in like multiple samples, how how does it? Manage? Yeah, if if you have so so if you have SVs that are overlapping and you want to distinguish between them, yeah. if you can, if you can find so there's a good and there's a bad here. If you can find chambers which separate them, let's say the broke break points, then you'll do a very good job of distinguishing this. If you cannot find a breakpoint that separates them, the camera is falling in both of them, then you will not be able to distinguish. But that will be an issue of how much overlap you see and if the breakpoints are overlapping. If the breakpoints are overlapping or the amount of overlap is huge, then that will be an issue for mapping mapping based approaches. But if the breakpoints even are off by few base pairs, you have enough information for a breakpoint to potentially separate them. Yeah, so in, this is just a conceptual question. If you have a, a duplication, with, where, where the same short <coughs> can be duplicated multiple times, then I imagine that this graph is going to look like a circle and it just keeps on... The brain graph? Yeah. Yeah, so if you, so so if you have a duplication, it will, it will just... Uh, you, so anyways, if you have a duplication, you will have a loop, right? right? So if you're trying to predict using the brain graph that you... using color to bring graph, if you have a duplication, unless you see a difference in the breakpoint that happens, it will probably not Right, because you would never know how often it goes. Well, you can have a camera count, um, uh, yeah, right? Can have, if you have, you have a camera count, you can, but if you don't, probably this will not work, right? Yeah. Then it will fail over. Yeah. And I have one more question. Uh, so in Kevlar, you said that you look at the camera that appears in the child that's not present in the parents yes. to identify the novos. Yes. Does it mean that the cameras need to be fairly large? Because if they're too small, then you would never... No, that's... You, so, no, I... I, I wish I had this 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 figure. I don't. As a matter of fact, when cameras start to go around 30, 35 base pair, majority of the cameras that you see in the reference shop are going to be under 85, 90 percent of the cameras. So it's not going to be like you will see. It's not. There there are cameras that appear many many times, but after cameras of around 30, 35 base pair, majority around 90 percent will be unique. And as a matter of fact, we and others have done simulation that you you get the human genome. And you randomly assign variation, right? Mm -hmm. And then you will see how many of them produce cameras of, let's say, 32, which is unique into the majority of them. Okay. But 90, 90. Thank you. Um, so, I had a question. Is there a way that you do quality scores in this framework? Or do you quality scores? Yeah. None of the methods I've seen use quality scores. And is that not? Uh, useful. It is useful. I think the only one that might have been using quality score will be discussing it because it maps back the maps back the reads to the variant that prediction, so they can look at it. But none others use that. And quality scores are helpful, not much though. Even mapping based methods usually, except SNP that they consider, none of the SPs or Indel use it. They all do what they filter the read. They see the read is bad and they throw it out. You can do the same thing. But that's a good one. That's generally a, if you're using camera stuff, you do use the quality score. You can assume the quality, bring the quality of the camera of the read to it. Provocative question. Uh, long reads? <laughs> yeah, 
long grids, um, I don't think this approach is, will be very helpful for long grids, right? Long grids, you just build the assembly, or if you're in a Java good reference contract map, so I don't think this will be helpful for long grids. <coughs> Especially the error in long grids is high, so you don't even, if you want to say, oh, I'm going to use the long cameras, you don't have that because the errors will just break. Also, have people use any of these? Yeah, as a matter of fact, that is, that is something that he, it's one of the attractive things that you don't need a reference genome, right? So, so you can compare different species and see where are the regions that completely, like, what are the cameras that are completely new in one species and build that simply then on camera. So part, this, this, I think, will be more attractive for non human genomes. But uh, of course, if they are really, really diverse, then probably you will not get any. Well, you don't get by comparing. Anyways, maybe you're then interested in things that are similar. 